Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 38th installment of the Galen Data Medical Device Innovation Webinar Series. I'll be your host today. My name is Dwayne Mancini. I'm the CEO at Project MedTech. Today, we'll be hearing from Etienne Nichols, a GreenLake guru, for a conversation on revolutionizing risk management in MedTech, how to integrate risk throughout the device lifecycle. With medical device regulatory agencies spotlighting risk management, knowing the rules and effective strategies for integrating risk across your device's lifecycle is crucial. Whether you're a seasoned expert or a newcomer, today we'll, we'll learn how to find how to overcome challenges like ownership confusion, data retrieval inefficiencies, and poor documentation traceability. But first, a few housekeeping slides and some information on Galen Data and Greenlight Guru. Galen Data is an FDA compliant cloud for medical device manufacturers. The Galen Cloud provides a configurable platform for device to cloud connectivity that is compliant to FDA, HIPAA, and CE Mark standards. The company is ISO 13485 certified, and the product on AWS is High Trust certified as well. Founded by seasoned medical device professionals, the company's goal is to make medical device cloud connectivity available to all at a fraction of the cost while shaving months off the development timeline. Galen Data allows medical device companies to stay medical device companies and not become IT companies. Finally, some quick logistics. Um, as we're going through this, if you have any questions on your control panel, whether that be on the right-hand side, left-hand side, bottom or top, you can drop questions in there and uh, we'll either save them all, the, all for the end for Etienne or we'll ask him as he's going throughout, if, assuming they're pertinent to where he's at in his presentation. Um, there's also a couple handouts in that control panel as well. Um, there's some more information on Galen Data and then also a white paper uh, that Galen Data had um, written. A reminder that you'll receive a recording of this webinar via email and feel free to follow up with anybody from Galen Data or Greenlight Guru should you have any additional questions. Um, some more information on, on Greenlight Guru. Greenlight Guru is on a mission to improve the quality of life for their customers and patients. Not only does Greenlight Guru offer an award-winning electronic quality management system, but they host an amazing podcast uh, that Etienne posts um, and they give a ton of free content in terms of web webinars, in-person events, and I'm sure Etienne can share, share more there. Um, but at Greenlight Guru, their focus is on moving med tech forward. That means helping you get your life-changing medical devices to market and keeping them there over time. They know the challenges that medical device companies face in this heavily regulated industry. Their solutions are designed to help streamline your processes so you can navigate the regulatory hurdles and succeed in the market. Greenlight Guru's MedTech suite provides quality management, product development, and clinical data management solutions, along with high quality training and education designed exclusively for medical devices. See why 1,100 of the world's leading MedTech companies trust Greenlight Guru by heading over to their website, www.greenlight.guru. Uh, and after today's presentation, you can see a personalized demo. So with that being said, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Etienne Nichols, Etienne, the virtual floor is all yours. All right, thank you, Dwayne. Really appreciate it and great to be with you all today. Uh, today we're gonna to be talking about integrating risk management throughout the device lifecycle in the coming decade. Um, not, uh, well, let's just go ahead and get started. He already mentioned some things about Greenlight Guru. As he mentioned, our goal is to improve the quality of life. So um, yeah, love to chat more about that if anybody's interested, but uh, we'll kind of move on from now. My name is Etienne Nichols, as he already mentioned. I'm a medical device guru here at Greenlight Guru. I'm also the host of the Global Medical Device Podcast. It's really fun, get to talk to a lot of professionals. Uh, but just a little bit about my background. I started out as a mechanical engineer working in product development uh, or manufacturing actually, and uh, then moved to product development, got my PMP, became a, a project manager for a drug delivery combination product company uh, where I managed design controls and risk management. And I got to see a lot of different uh, ways of doing risk management, uh, uh, some good, some not as fun. And uh, maybe we can talk about that. Uh, uh, Dwayne already mentioned the questions. So if you have questions, put those in the chat. I'd love to, love to make this more conversational so that we can answer some of those questions. But these are the things that we're planning to talk about today. So some of the topics we wanna cover are the current challenges with risk management for medical device companies. There are specific challenges uh, to medical device companies when it comes to risk management. Uh, different people coming in from the industry 
look at this as uh, why don't you just do it this this and this way well kind of goes to our second point um be, you need to understand risk management as it's defined by iso 14971 particularly 2019 uh, unless you are um, uh, a european company that may uh, be under the a11 uh, so uh, iso 14971 2019 is the standard for risk management for medical device companies and so that's what we're going to be focusing on uh, on today. And then the third point, incorporating risk management through the design control process. A lot of times, and we'll talk about this as we get there, but uh, a lot of companies look at this as a parallel track. You know, they treat it like a parallel track. Maybe they don't think of it that way, but it seems to be treated that way where you have design controls on one side and risk management on the other, and never the two shall meet when it should be a, a revolving process and a, an, evol an evolving process. And so we're going to look at that and also look at risk management as a tool and not just as a hindrance to design and development. Uh, and then last, we'll kind of wrap up so you know where we are in the top in the in the webinar when we get to the risk-based approach for your quality management system processes. That's kind of the end. And we'll do a uh, um, we'll, we'll, one person asked for a case study, so I don't know exactly how to do a full-blown case study on. Um, uh, on risk management for a medical device company, but I'm thinking at that point, maybe we can uh, show you how we would build out uh, a, a few risk lines. So stay tuned for that. We'll try to do that towards the end there. And then of course, we'll have the Q&A. Let's talk about the current challenges in risk management. So one of the things that uh, uh, that I've seen in the industry, these are the top four that I've seen, or these are common hurdles anyway, that it comes uh, that come up when we start talking about risk management in med tech. And one is time, the amount of time it takes. When you have a, uh, a risk management spreadsheet that's hundreds of lines long, each one of those needs to be evaluated very carefully, takes a considerable amount of time. And historically, I've seen uh, the teams get thrown into a conference room and they lock the door and, and the last man standing as one comes out, it, it's, 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 a, it's a time consuming process. Uh, the amount of resources required for risk management is considerable sometimes when it comes to uh, thinking through all of the, the different ways they interact uh, and, and the documentation required and the testing and the mitigation. And then budget, um, which kind of alludes to all of the different things I already mentioned with resources. And then lastly is the guesswork, which uh, we're we're going to talk a little bit about guesswork and the risk evaluation process, but those are common hurdles. But I want to know what are what are the top challenges you face with managing risk for your device today? So I don't know if I uh, if you can see on your screen a poll in progress. Um, the question is, what is the top top challenge you face with managing risk for your device today? And we probably should have put an other in there, but go ahead and answer that as best you can. Be good to see good to see what the what we have. <clears throat> Or what your challenges are, and of course you can always put those in the questions as well. Maybe we can try to uh, uh, to, to look at some of those challenges. So sometimes it takes a minute for it to come up. So if it hasn't popped up yet, just give it a second and then just kind of answer it as best you can. Yeah, and Tim, we're on. seeing some we're seeing some uh, <clears throat> uh, answers coming in here. Great. What's it look at? Is is anything predominant or, or um, dominating? Insufficient data to assess risk is about 50% right now. Um, as more of the vote comes in, that's certainly staying higher. And then the uh, the other ones are pretty split, like right around between 23 and 32% for the other four. Um, oh, they're pretty okay. even. But insufficient data to assess risk is is definitely the the highest. And we have about 70% of the vote in. <clears throat> All right. Fantastic. Well, that's probably a good cross section. I'd say we we, we likely have enough uh, to go off there. All right. Let's let's kind of keep trucking then. Uh, we actually did a 2023 medtech industry benchmark report um, earlier this year. I think it was February that this came out, where we actually asked over 600 medtech companies what their biggest challenges were. And uh, you know, this wasn't what I was expecting at all, but a third of them said it was a lack of clear ownership for risk throughout the product lifecycle. So that was that was interesting. Insufficient design and development information, which kind of what you were saying, there's not enough information to assess the product risk. Sounds like that was the majority here, and it's a close second for for our medtech industry report. Um, and then visibility and traceability. So actually being able to connect 
your design controls to your risk management. That is a common hurdle, and uh, it seemed to be really high up there as well. Um, keeping up with the regulatory changes of ISO 14971, it's been out for now, you know, four years, so um, it's not as, uh, you know, prevalent, but it's still just making sure that we're on top of those. Um, Post-market feedback, um, we're going to get into that a little bit later, but that is one of the requirements of ISO 14971, the 2019 version. And then overuse or over-reliance on FMEAs, and that's... Um, that, that makes sense to me when I looked at that. Um, all of these things are challenges that you likely have faced if you're not currently facing these. All right, let's do another poll. Uh, what tools are you currently using to, to document and manage that device risk? We'll give it just a moment to see if it can, like I said, it, it, sometimes we have a little bit of a delay, so I just give it a moment to pop up. And we'll see see what's coming in. Again, I always wish we had that other because no matter how many how many options you put, there's always an additional one out there that someone uses and, and it's always interesting to hear what right. those are. But yeah. Yeah, we have uh a little over half the vote in, I guess almost sixty percent now. Um 70% is digital paper, spreadsheets, so Word, Excel, shared drives. Um, which to me would indicate there's probably a lot of startups on the line. 33% are using industry-specific risk management software, 10% uh, general purpose software, and we have 14% at pen and paper. Okay. Okay. Well, now that's – okay, that's that's a good cross-section. Interesting. All right. Well, we'll talk about that um, and just some of the different ways. Uh, I think that's probably enough time. I think we can probably shut that down. Um, so when we looked at our report and we did the same thing, looked at the different challenges and the tools that people are using, we, we got a, I don't know if this correlates exactly, I should have been writing some of those down, but uh, for risk management, of course, we asked about quality management, design controls, and risk management. Risk management is over half were using those general purpose, purpose tools, and that would probably include the pen and paper um, crowd as well, I would expect, uh, and, sent, and then some general general tools about 19 percent and then just barely a little over a quarter uh, those things uh, those specific to, to the medical device industry and one of the reasons we ask about this uh, is because when we're talking about ISO 14971 there are some things that are pretty specific to medical device so these other tools do make it a little bit more difficult but um, we'll, t we'll talk about that so before we get into any of those specifics, maybe it's a good idea to just kind of give, give an overview and understanding of ISO 14971. So ISO 14971, 2019, it's a standalone, uh, to a certain degree, a standalone uh, standard for risk management um, because it has no normative references, meaning it doesn't rely on uh, um, some of these others, although it is referenced uh, by some other standards. So it's uh, it's a consensus standard for the FDA, so uh, it is uh, it is a standard that is expected to be followed if you're um, if you're in Europe. Um, it's a, it's a very prevalent uh, document, and it's something that as medical device manufacturers have already mentioned, it's a it's a requirement. So when we talk about updated terms and definitions, uh, one of the the difficulties that uh, we saw coming in was the ability to to keep up with the updates. Uh, from ISO 1497 to the previous version, whether well, that's 2012. And so let's just kind of run through some of those because they are pretty, they're, they're not just updates, they're almost pillars to a certain degree. So some of those include uh, the definition of benefit. Um, so the definition of benefit in, in clause 3.2 of ISO 14971 2019 is defined as the positive impact or desirable outcome of the use of a medical device in the health of an individual or a positive impact on patient management or public health. But it removes uh, or, or any, any possibility or thought of this being a uh, economic benefit. So that's something to, to think about as well. In 315, clause 3.15, uh, there, there was an addition of reasonably foreseeable misuse. 
and uh, re reasonable foreseeable misuse was one of the, the terms that was mentioned, and it is the use of a product or a system in a way not intended by the manufacturer, uh, but can result from readily predictable human behavior. Okay, the legal jargon aside, reasonable foreseeable misuse is something being misused in a way that you could expect someone to misuse. And I'll just do a quick example. Um, if you've ever used a flat blade screwdriver, uh, a reasonable foreseeable misuse of that flat blade screwdriver might be to take the lid off of a paint can or to, you know, uh, even worse, to hammer it back on. Now, anybody who's painted has probably used a flat blade screwdriver that way. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a misuse of a tool and it's reasonably foreseen that they're going to, to use it that way. So that's, that's one of the things to think about. As medical device manufacturers, we have to think about reasonable foreseeable misuse. Another one of the definitions was um, state of the art, which you might hear thrown around quite a bit. That's clause 3.28. State of the art was defined as developed state or technical capability at a given time regarding products, processes, services based on the relevant, and this is an interesting word, consolidated findings of science, technology, and experience. Again, legalese aside, what does that mean? State of the art is not the cutting edge, State of the art is what is expected in the industry or, or kind of understood. This is what we use. Um, so it's, it's, it's not necessarily cutting edge, but state of the art is uh, the consolidated, the relevant consolidated findings within science and technology. And then the last term and definition that I'll throw out um, that, that I think is important is from clause 3.3, which is the definition of a harm. So if you kind of remember from some of the previous Definition of the harm was really focused on the user or the, the patient, but uh, harm has been expanded a little bit. So harm, when you're considering the harms that your device may incur, it's uh, in physical injury or damage to the health of people or damage to the property or damage to the environment. So think people, property, and the environment. Um, and it's the other expansion that I'll just kind of highlight is it's not just physical injury, it's it's damage to the health of people. So you start thinking about uh, the, the mental health of people as well. So it's just a slightly expanded, but you think about people, whether that's physical or mental, um, property and environment. All right, let's get into uh, I'll mention a little bit more about the clarification of risk analysis. It talks a little bit more about benefit risk analysis. So that's, that's going to be coming from Clause 7.4 if you're taking notes. Uh, ISO 14971 2019, it only required that risk deemed as unacceptable uh, have benefit risk analysis. And so that's, that's important um, if you have risks that are unacceptable. And in, in a little bit here, we'll get, get into how you determine whether acceptable or unacceptable. Uh, but um, if you're in Europe, uh, some of the requirements of EUMDR requires that all your risk items have a benefit risk analysis. So it's important to understand what may be piled on top of just not just ISO 14971, but other regulatory requirements. So I wanted to just kind of highlight that those marketing in Europe will need a, a benefit risk analysis or a common referred, commonly referred to as the unfortunate acronym of BRA. Um, if you're in Europe, all risk items will need that. And then one of the other things that uh, came uh, in 2019 was the uh, addition of Clause 10, which talked about the production and post-production activities. And this was more in alignment uh, to align with ISO 1345. So I 13, ISO 1345 Clause 8 talks about um, uh, it, it talks about uh, improvement and it talks about measurement and uh, it kind of focuses on that, those post-production uh, activities. So uh, complaint handling, customer feedback, internal auditing, control of non-conforming product, data analysis, improvement, all those different things are in clause eight. Well, this production and post-production activities uh, section within ISO 14971 is, is meant to align with those. Uh, so all of that aside, you know, the jargon aside, essentially what that's saying is this is no longer a, an activity to get you to market. This is an activity that should be continually informed once you're on the market. So it needs to be uh, continually updated. It's no longer a pen and paper or a printed off document in a thick binder 
that never to be revisited until the FDA comes to audit you. This is something that you're looking at and continually updating. A few guidances that I think are important uh, to really do a good job with risk management are, uh, these come from uh, the technical report 24971. If anyone is out there who has not uh, gotten 24971, I highly recommend getting 24971. It's, a, it's basically uh, a guidance on how to implement 14971. And uh, so, I'll just kind of go briefly through some of the annexes that you'll find in uh, 24971. Um, you'll find that uh, the, the rationale for requirements, risk management for medical devices, fundamental risk concepts, and uh, and then you you go, you go into more detail about, for example, Annex F, risk management for cybersecurity, um, Annex G, how to put together that risk management file. And then there was a question that came up about IVDs. It gives a little bit more detail on how to handle specifics as they relate to IVDs. All right. I hope I hope all that made sense. Uh, again, feel free to put those questions in the in the comments and or, or in the uh, those questions in, and we'll try to get to to whatever specifics you may have regarding some of those things. We'll get we'll get into how to do all of this in just a moment. So. Uh, there's additional annex. There's an additional annex uh, that A A11. Uh, if, if you are in Europe and you need to adhere to those, it, it basically is pointing to uh, the EMDR and uh, shows uh, shows the requirements for uh, for meeting the general safety and performance requirements of the EMDR. All right, let's get into understanding risk management, the importance of risk, and uh, and as it relates to medical devices. So there's some important terms to remember. One of those is risk analysis. So this is a systematic use of available information to identify hazards to estimate the risk. That sounds pretty basic, um, but it also within the risk analysis, uh, there are four sections, four things you need to remember. There's the description of the intended use. There's the characteristics of a medical device as it relates to the safety and uh, the identification of hazards and hazardous situations, and then estimation of risk. Don't worry, we'll get into that a little bit more in uh, in the following slides, but it's essentially risk analysis is, it's, it's a systematic use of all of this information, and uh, it's putting that together in a systematic way. So risk risk estimation. This is how how do we assign the likelihood of something happening or the how bad it is uh, the severity of that harm. So risk estimation, that's that process. And uh, we, we use a table to show you how to do that. So we'll get into that in a moment. And then the risk evaluation shows um, how you look at that, those assigned values, and then how you put that against your uh, criteria to determine whether it's acceptable or not acceptable. Um, because remember, in uh, if we have any unacceptable risks per, per ISO 14971, you do have to have a benefit risk analysis. So we need to determine whether those are acceptable or unacceptable. Risk assessment is just the overall process related to this. I see you came off of, uh, 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 do you have a question? What's up, Dwayne? I, I, I we have one. I think it's yeah. quite pertinent now because it, it came in now. It was an EUMDR benefit risk. Um, EUMDR benefit risk for each risk. So that was like the statement. Then it says, does this mean a benefit risk for each severity times occurrence has to show reduction in severity or occurrence or both? Yeah, good question. So essentially, when you talk about uh, the, the, the well, you're talking about the subcomponents of risk. So essentially, you want to reduce the risk. You may not be able to reduce the severity of that risk, but you may be able to reduce the probability of that risk. So if you're able to do that as far as possible, and if you look at the, I, I have it somewhere here on my, my desktop, but if you look at the ISO 14971 2019 plus A11, it talks about all the different ways uh, or terminology used in EUMDR uh, regarding that reduction of risk. So that's as far as possible, as low as reasonably acceptable, um, mitigated as, as as much as possible. And, and, and I'm forgetting, there's like six or seven of those different phrases. You're looking at the risk. You're not looking at necessarily the severity and the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the likelihood or the uh, probability. 
because a lot of times you can only reduce one. So I hope that answers the question. It's not uh, it's not each component of the risk, but it is just as much as you can um, reducing yeah. as far as possible. Awesome, yeah, if that person's out there, if you're listening in, you still have more on that question, just feel free to fire away. All right, Etienne. Yeah. Yeah, and on that note, I don't know if I have additional things in, uh, I'm glad you brought this up because it made me think something else. Um, when it comes to writing those BRAs, uh, I get a lot of questions about how to do that. And I, the technical report 24971 actually has specific examples on how to do that um, with different results. So again, another plug for checking out that technical report 24971 will make your life easier when it comes to actually writing out these documents. So cool. Risk controls, this is the process uh, in which decisions are made and how you're going to mitigate, uh, how are you going to mitigate your uh, risks? Uh, we already mentioned severity, maybe you can't reduce the severity, but you likely can reduce the probability, whether that's through, uh, there are three ways in which you can control risks. Um, and in the order in which ISO 14971 would like you to approach those, number one is change the design to where it's inherently safe by design. That's the most ideal way to mitigate a risk. The second way would be from protective controls. So I think about like if you have a, um, a bone saw and you have a, a, a blade over the top part that's, not, that's exposed to the surgeon, maybe that is a protective measure. Um, the surgeon could still get his hand in there or whatever and it might produce new risks, but you've controlled it using a protect, uh, protective measure. And uh, I've kind of alluded to the following residual risk, um, which I'll get back to that in just a minute. But then the third way of mitigating a risk is through training or instructions for use, IFUs. The least effective, because nobody reads instructions, unfortunately, but that is the, those are the different ways you can control those risks. So I want to tie that back to our EMDR question. Um, if you have you know, your series of uh, things that you've done and you've mitigated as far as possible, you see there's still a risk. You haven't you haven't removed it completely. Now you're going to write your benefit risk analysis and say uh, there's a certain amount of risk. However, the benefit outweighs the risk. And it's essentially what you're saying. Um, you might say we have put in place instructions for use as an attempt to mitigate this, but again, the the benefit is outweighing the risk. And so that residual risk. This is the risk remaining after the risk control measures have been taken. I mentioned the protective uh, protective cover um, on that bone saw. Uh, as uh, you've you've reduced the likelihood of the surgeon or nurse, as they put their hands around to help put hold things in place, uh, getting cut by the top of that saw. But now, if something got cut caught in there and pulled in, that that may produce a new risk. Well, that's a residual risk, and so it's essentially going to create a new risk line and uh, needs to be evaluated as well. You can't just say we've reduced it. Um, you may have re residual risks and you need to evaluate this as well. And I apologize if I get a little bit hoarse here. We, Thanksgiving just happened and I've had some uh, some throat, nose and throat things going on. So just, excuse me for just a moment, apologies. Okay, another question, Dwayne? I'm back. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. How do you define an acceptable versus unacceptable risk? Quantitative, qualitative? Who defines it? Is it technical? Is it legal? Is it medical? Um, yeah. Mm, great question. I love that. And I'm going to make a. Um, I'm going to put off answering it just a moment because I have a visual that I think might help. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I've got a note to answer that. Love it. Perfect. I'll All save right. it too. Yep. Great. So let's talk about building out a, a risk management file. Uh, at a high level, this is what's required um, for your risk management file. Now, if you look in ISO 14971, each one of these are, are required. They are not required to be in a physical file. For those of you who may be on paper or whatever, um, this is not a physical file per se, although it could be. Um, this could be a reference to each one of these documents. So however you have things laid out, <clears throat> uh, these have to be present and then you have to be able to compile them or reach them uh, at, at whenever you're being audited or uh, uh, if you're updating your risk management process or controls um, and analysis, uh, maybe from post uh, uh, production, um, after you get a little bit more information, 
this needs to be all accessible in a certain way. So a lot of times I like just using it as a, as a reference document if that's how you like to set that up, but all of those documents need to be in place. And the way risk management needs to be approached is from a life cycle um, perspective. We talk about uh, when you need to start your risk management. And a lot of times people look at it at development and that's that's a good place to have formal risk management in place. But once you're starting to even conceptualize your de design, maybe you've really figured out the problem you're trying to solve um, and you start thinking of different ways to solve it, you have, uh, you have a few concepts in mind, you need to start thinking about the risks as you think about the design itself. Now I'm gonna to go to design controls just briefly. Um, if you're not familiar with design controls, uh, we have a lot of resources out there. I don't have any to give you at the moment. Feel free to reach out and I'll, I'll do what I can to help. But design controls is five essential columns. You have user needs. I'm gonna do it this way if you know, on your right. User needs, so that intended use, and then design inputs, design outputs. You need to start thinking about risk management at the same time you start thinking about those design controls. So maybe around concept of design, uh, you start to develop it for commercial, definitely have to have uh, some formalized risk management in place. Um, you need it for launch, and then it needs to be revisited post-market. And uh, this is gonna kind of speak to that, um, how do you define acceptable and unacceptable, qualitative, quantitative, post-market's gonna inform that. And I'm gonna answer that in just a minute. Um, and and uh, so, so just kind of hang on to your hat for a minute. <clears throat> All right, so we're gonna go through some different steps as you are building out your risk management. Um, number one, you're going to establish this risk management framework, and what does that include? That includes defining your risk management process. Um, so how are you going to approach risk? How are you going to evaluate those risks? Um, what is acceptable? What is, what is unacceptable? And ultimately, unacceptable and acceptable is determined by your organization. It's not, uh, legal should be involved, but it doesn't. It 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 really uh, falls down to um, you and your relationship with the uh, the patient. So what does that mean? Um, if the benefit out, if there is a benefit that is great enough, there is no risk that is not worth the benefit. And I'm going to stop and and kind of rephrase that. If you have a situation where a, a patient is terminally ill and they are they are not going to survive anyway, they know they have no chance of surviving, and you have a highly dangerous, let's say you use a drug or a, um, in a, in a, you're in a clinical trial that there has tremendous side effects, but there's a chance it could save this person, that benefit may outweigh the risks for that person. So. It has to be determined between you and and if you're using uh, if 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 you're uh, this is for uh, the the physicians um, that's kind of decided uh, based on that those conversations with the physician and uh, and internally how much risk are you willing to to take on what are the things that really make this worth it so it it, it all goes back to your intended use statement we're going to get to that in just a moment as well when we start talking about risk analysis uh, okay so that. That's defining the risk management process, all of those documents that need to get in place, um, defining those things. And I imagine there may be specific questions about that, we can get to those as well. Um, you're going to establish those management roles. So if you have a project manager, you have uh, a technical lead, maybe you have, um, if a risk is high enough, but you still feel that the, the benefit is there, it needs to be elevated to top management. How are you going to do those things? Then you're gonna document that risk management plan and establish a living risk management file. Living, I, I'm going to keep emphasizing this, that needs to be revisited post-production. All right, we do have a risk management plan. I forgot about this. If someone's interested in checking this out, um, feel free to go to www.greenlight.guru forward slash, <laughs> forward slash downloads, forward slash risk, dash management, dash plan, dash template. We probably should have made that a little bit shorter, um, but you. We'll also provide these slides to you um, and you'll be able to use that link if you're interested. You can download this uh, SOP, the Standard Operating Procedure. This is something that we develop internally for our customers. And so um, it's been through many audits. Feel free to jump over there and check that out if it's if it's beneficial. So the next, next part of your risk management is this risk assessment. Um, so risk assessment, 
uh, it, it's built, uh, it, it, this is part of the risk analysis. So this is, comes from ISO 14971, 2019, Clause 5.4 risk analysis. And there are four things it talks about. Number one is you need to specify that intended use. Now, this might be sound familiar when you're thinking of design controls. Again, these are not just parallel tracks, these feed each other. So you're going to specify the intended use as you start thinking about um, your medical device. Um, in ISO 14971, it talks about very specific things such as uh, patient population, um, uh, the actual uh, area of the body potentially, the actual disease state that you're going to be uh, covering. So you specify that intended use, you are now going to start identifying hazards. So what are the, the hazards? Those are the potential sources of harm associated with your product, uh, known as hazards. Now, some people have a difficult time, maybe we aren't morbid enough, maybe we aren't creative enough, thinking about how different different ways someone could hurt themselves with our device. But let's say you have a, if you have a scalpel, you have the potential for a sharps injury. Um, by design, it's designed to cut flesh um, that is supposed to be cut, but it could also cut things that are not supposed to be cut. So you have a potential sharps hazard. Um, if you have a motor or if you have a uh, um, uh, an electrical component, there's a potential for shock, uh, electrical shock. So all of those are hazards. And again, if you have trouble identifying or coming up with hazards, look at ISO 14971 Annex C. It has a table full of hazards that uh, um, could potentially um, can be, be useful. Um, all right, if we get to uh, hazardous situations and foreseeable for in a sequence of events, same thing, um, Annex C of ISO 14971 uh, defines a few hazardous situations and shows you what some of those are. Um, and I can show you that table in just a moment. Uh, we're going to be doing a few things here in just a minute. And then that, that estimation of risk. Again, we talked about this already. This is the combination of severity and, and uh, probability, and you estimate that. So I believe, yeah, okay. So we have, we have a table just kind of as an example on how you de define those. Um, this, this is called a risk acceptability matrix by much of the industry. Um, and a lot of software you see calls this risk acceptability matrix. I prefer to look at this as a risk evaluation matrix. And I'll tell you why. So let's, let's uh, say you're one in 100, that's frequent. Um, if you have an issue in the field, and I'm gonna use that uh, scalpel example, you have a scalpel that um, it just consistently cuts the surgeon. It should never cut the surgeon, but just maybe maybe the way the ergonomics is, it always slips in a certain way. Um, and you realize one in a hundred out when it goes out the door, uh, one in a hundred are going to cut a surgeon. And so that's frequent. So maybe that's um, maybe it's not critical. And again, some of this can be defined based on your field or your industry, your, your sub-industry within the medical device industry. Um, if maybe one in a hundred is not frequent. Maybe you, maybe you have only a hundred devices that go out a year, and one in a hundred, um, maybe uh, improbable. Uh, one in ten is frequent for you. So you need to determine that internally. Um, it's it it can be somewhat subjective, but it can be determined not just by you arbitrarily picking a number but you talking to the hospital and doing competitive analysis. What do my competitors, what, what's frequent from a phys physician standpoint when they see other products in the market? And uh, maybe one in a hundred is very uh, uh, improbable and it's, uh, you, you, they consider that improbable and, and you wanna beat that. So you, you've kind of look at this almost as a competitive analysis. So the different ways to approach this, it should definitely be a cross uh, functional team that determines all of these different things. Typically critical will be loss of limb or life-threatening life injury. There are other ways to uh, word this. For example, um, this, this serious short-term injury or impairment requiring additional medical intervention to correct uh, or re-operation. Um, this could, uh, you, you could define these 
however you want. Let's say you are a tongue depressor and you know, well, you anticipate, uh, you, you never anticipate anyone dying from your, the use of your tongue depressor, but you still have a critical, uh, maybe you can make it critical if it splinters and is lodged and, and creates an infection. Maybe that's critical for your industry. Uh, typically you see just critical being loss of limb, life-threatening injury, but you kind of define these things. Now, that being said, always begin with the end in mind. I think of that Stephen Covey quote, always begin with the end in mind. When you define these things, you will be the one to defend these things as well. And when I say defend, there's two situations you will need to defend these in. Um, maybe three, I suppose. One is uh, in, in the, attempt, uh, in the uh, instance of an audit. Let's say the FDA comes in to inspect you, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm past the submission phase, I suppose, at this point. Um, but obviously, this will be something you'll, you'll be discussing in your submission as well. But you will have to defend this, whether through your submission or um, to those auditing agencies. The other is in the event of a uh, product liability case. So legal was mentioned. I definitely recommend in the setup of this, um, what is the likelihood that, that you could potentially have a legal uh, liability case? This is something you need to consider. Um, the regulatory agencies are there to protect the public, but uh, um, uh, you are more likely to um, suffer injury, I guess, uh, for lack of a better way, from a product liability case. So think about that as well. And then third thing, I mean, we are all medical device professionals. I, I, uh, can you sleep at night, depending on how you define these things and how you accept those things? All right, I'm gonna circle back to what I said earlier about this being somewhat of a risk evaluation matrix because there's two things that, that potentially happen. So one, you you might have a risk that is in this red or this orange, you say, okay, um, I'm, I'm not gonna accept those. Well, eh, what if one winds up in the orange and the benefit, that is the benefit. We, we cannot remove that risk without reducing the benefit as well. And the benefit is what we're after. So you may write a benefit risk analysis and say, we can accept this, even though it's in the orange, and ordinarily we would not accept that, this is this is more of an evaluation situation. The other thing is, maybe you have a risk over here that's in the green, you've established that if it's in green, it's acceptable, but you might think, eh, you know what, we could actually reduce that. I don't really wanna accept that risk for that particular feature. Maybe there's a burr and an a injection molded part, and we could, you know, we could figure out a way to make that burr go away and never have that. So now we're gonna bring, reduce it down to occasional one in 10,000, and we're not accepting that. All I say, all, all I bring that up is to say the color um, should not necessarily say it's acceptable or it's unacceptable. Really to think, okay, where is this falling and what kind of either verification or analysis uh, uh, with the benefit does this need to, needs to happen? So sorry for spending too much time on this table, but there's a lot here. Um, I welcome any questions surrounding that. Um, but let's kind of move on. Okay. Um, I mentioned tying risk management to design controls. It's important to understand the intended use um, and the, the, the full uh, ramifications of that intended use. Uh, I also want to continue to drive home that product, product risk management is a, a cycle. Even during product development, it should be constantly, it should be constantly informing design controls. Now, what does that mean? So when we build out design controls, we don't just build out design controls and move on to risk management. This gets into more of the softer side of risk management, I guess. Um, risk management and design controls, they both have the same purpose. The goal is to produce a safe and effective device. In fact, if you read um, Part 820 of the FDA, 21 CFR Part 820, that is the purpose of the uh, 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 good manufacturing practice is, uh, and, the, and the controls there is to produce safe and effective devices. So. When you start building out your design controls, you should build out your risk management at the same time and they should be informing each other. So how does that work? Your design controls, as you come up with design inputs, let's say the user need is, it need, we need a, a handheld device. And so your design input is, it needs to be less than three pounds, let's say. And so um, there's a risk there though, if. Uh, you, you, well, in your design output, you, you have a drawing that shows the ergonomics and it's less than three pounds and that's great. But 
you realize that there, the material you chose is slippery and it falls out of the hands and it constantly um, uh, falls out on the patient. And so there's this risk that we've realized. So during development, you've identified a risk that the material or the surface finish is too fine and it's slipping out of the hands and so forth. And so you use that risk line to mitigate that risk and you go back to your design controls to say, I'm going to add another design controls that the surface finish, maybe maybe that user need is still a handheld device. Uh, we now have a second design input that the surface finish be less than or, or between so much, um, I don't remember what the units are for a surface finish. It's been too long since I've used a profilometer, but you, you get the idea. It's not gonna be slippery. And so then you go back to your risk management. You say, okay, we mitigated this using this design input. And so now you have your mitigation in place. So they should be feeding each other. Um, another slide that I forget about sometimes. So I mentioned early on, we forget, uh, or, or we may not be creative when it comes to coming up with these different risks sometimes. So we've actually built a tool that helps you uh, with certain, with, with a lot of different product codes. If you have a product code, maybe your, your predicate device has certain risks um, associated with it or adverse events in the mod database, typically you would go back and you would crawl those different databases and try to evaluate, okay, what risks could I have associated with mine? We've actually developed an AI tool that helps you, uh, you put in your product develop or, or your, your product code and we go and the AI tool says, okay, um, based on the mod databases and all the different things that are out there from the FTA and so forth, um, these are the risks you need to be thinking about this at least a baseline, um, a baseline uh, a, a way of looking at this. And this is based on Bayesian statistics, and uh, obviously you could build on it from there. It's not a, it's not a one and done, but it's a 80% and done, uh, and, and you keep moving on. So very, very helpful. Another option that we have, if you want to check it out, www.greenlight.guru forward slash risk dash solutions. If you can't remember that or don't have uh, um, uh, uh, you know, a way of taking notes. Um, we'll give you the slides. You can check that out. All right. Now I already talked about risk controls a little bit. Um, the three main areas are inherent safety by design, protective measures, and instructions for use or training. Once you go through those, you determine, okay, is my risk control measure required? And this is a table that you can find in ISO 14971. We've color coded it, make it a little bit easier. If this risk control uh, measure is required, um, you put that in place, maybe you change your design. Um, if you can't change your design, you establish, uh, or, or if depending on how you mitigate it, you will still need to establish, are there any residual risks? And if they are acceptable, whether they're low, medium, high, depending on how you determine that, um, you'll document that still as a residual risk and show that it's acceptable, put your BRA in place if it's uh, EUMDR or, um, and so forth is uh, once you have that residual risk, it's going to feed into uh, a reevaluation. So you're going to kind of go in a loop here until all your res residual risks are acceptable. Um, if it's not as low as possible, and uh, it, again, these a lot of times these are just feedback loops. If the risk isn't as low as possible, then you need to go back through. If it's going to affect the benefit, then you go on to the benefit or risk analysis and uh, determine whether or not the benefit outweighs the risk. So it's something that I don't think we think about the, the risk benefit analysis. Uh, we think about risk analysis sometimes, but we don't always think about benefit analysis. So that's something I, I really want the industry to start, start thinking about is thinking about your benefit analysis and that will help word all of your BRAs. All right. Kind of talked ahead of myself a little bit here. Um, the BRA is not just a blurb. I guess it's not just a. Uh, it, it's going. To, it's something that needs to be documented. It's objective evidence and rationale for why these medical benefits outweigh the an unacceptable risk. So, um, BRA is a special provision for moving forward with unacceptable risks, but uh, it needs to be uh, objective. This is not a subjective thing. All right, we get into a few more steps here. Um, 
14971 expects a an evaluation of the overall risk acceptability um, and that's not that you're going to look at each residual risk to determine if you need to mitigate it but once you're done looking at that all of the risk that is still there look at that and in totality and see if that total risk outweighs the uh, the totality of benefits for your medical device and then that needs to be weighed in a final uh, benefit risk analysis and acceptability needs to be uh, documented that will be documented in your risk management file okay again internal audits kappas complaints customer feedback nc's all of these are going to feed into the risk management process it needs to be a total product life cycle process just like iso 1345 requires um, and we're going to get into that uh, just in just a moment um, whoops what a Kind of back up, kind of flying. I just saw the clock. I realized I, I could talk too long, too long, too too much. Um, do you have a question, Dwayne? No, we have um, we have probably five or six uh, okay. in the queue. So I was more piping in to uh, figure out. Do you want me to ask them now, or should you, let's wait? Let's have you fly through some more slides, and then I'll ask. Let them me. Maybe. Yeah, let me fly it through some more. Maybe we'll answer them. Maybe we won't. But um, and if we don't get to any, you know, feel free to go ahead and forward them on, and we'll do what we can to get those answers to you. But yeah. okay, let's talk about risk management as a competitive advantage. One of the things you need to think about is doing it sooner than later uh, in the concept phase versus just the development phase. Um, at least be thinking, okay, where what are the things as we develop a concept? Well, how could that hurt somebody? Develop those alongside each other. Um, understand the purpose. Why are we doing this? It's to, to develop, uh, or why are we doing the risk management process? It's not just a checkbox activity. It's not a document just to satisfy a regulatory requirement. It is to inform your design. What is the value of real-time documentation? Well, FDA inspectors, ISO auditors, they all are likely going to review all of these different things. It needs to be uh, quality level. But let's talk about how you implement some of this in your quality management system as well, because um, if you read ISO 1345, uh, there is a greater emphasis on risk now. You'll find a lot of different, I have it in front of me, actually, I'll just, uh, I, I think I had one highlighted. Um, the controls that you put in place, this is now for supplier controls, they shall be proportionate to the risk involved and the ability of the external party. So controls shall be proportionate to the risk. That's something you see a lot more now that you're, uh, uh, the, the, the ISO 3045 focuses on risk. So how do you do that? Well, management review. What's the impact of failing to review critical items like CAPAs? Uh, what, what could happen to our organization if, if management isn't focused on those things? What about training? What if we don't have effective training? What about calibration? What's the difference in calibrating every quarter? Your, your different tools, um, I mentioned profilometer, maybe your uh, uh, different uh, 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 different tools like the measurement tools versus every year. It, is there a risk there? Purchasing, supplier management, and we should be managing those risks through the entire product life cycle. <clears throat> All right. Um, I want to I want to show you uh, if we have a minute. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and I want to show you a little bit about how you would even do some of this. see here all right I, hopefully you can see this screen um, this yep. is the inside of Greenlight Guru one person asked how I would do this in our software and so I'm just going to go to our risk management section so essentially what you would see here is uh, a way to create a risk project so I'm just going to say let's say we're going to do a balloon catheter and I could put a description in there My screen is too small for me. I'm needing to move it to my other screen for this to work. Let me do that. Just a moment. I'll move this over so I can see you still. All right. And if you want to tell me if there are any main questions that uh, maybe we can answer as we go through this. I might be able to do that. 
Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> um, how do the how do document the prob how to document the probabilities and severities of the risk? What is the best way to understand the matrix size? Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. So let, maybe we can answer that as we go through. So there's different ways you can calculate based on P1, P2. I don't want to get too detailed, but this is in the annexes of ISO 14971. Neither one is required. Um, well, one is required. I mean, but but it doesn't specify whether you have to have P1, P2, and we can talk about what that is. But uh, in our software, and you could do this however you need to do it, um, you, you basically need to figure out how do we want to break things down? Um, if we're selling in the millions, maybe we need a one in a million section. Uh, maybe we only sell 100. Maybe we don't need one in a million. Maybe we need just uh, one in 10,000. Um, and then you're critical to negligible. Uh, each individual company is going to determine that based on their specific industry. So if I was in the, uh, if I was in a pacemaker situation where I'm building out pacemakers, I might want to reduce everything pretty far down, but I also have multiple uh, systems. I have electronic, I have uh, some biocompatibility, I have um, some Bluetooth, depending on how, you know, how, how and then the physical case, I have all of the different components. So I may want to be able to break it down very granularly. So I think most of what I see is a four by four, but depending on your product, you may need a five by five. And I look at this as the complexity of your product. Typically the complexity of the grid goes up. Um, hopefully that answers the question. Um, these are free text forms, so you can always change that if you wanted. So let's just create a project and start assigning some risk. Anything, does that answer the question or any other? I, I, I think so. And then I, I'll ask another one while you're, while you're putting this together here, Etienne. Um, what kind of statistical analysis used for risk analysis and risk evaluation? Probably pretty similar question, but. Yeah, so it's a good question. So um, I don't have, there's some different papers out there and, and maybe we can follow up with that one on, uh, uh, with a with a paper on how what statistically you would use for those different things, but um, it would tie to ha the the level of risk that you have. So if you have a um, a feature that could potentially cause a loss of limb or or critical, uh, you would want to test that a much greater. You, know, you wouldn't want to have a, a low statistical sample size. You would want to test it greater. So I don't, I can't go into the details of that, but we could, we could definitely follow up on that. Yeah, because um, the next question down is the same thing, right? Criteria to choose the size of risk matrix. So I think that's a pretty, pretty hot topic. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's good feedback. That's good feedback. Yep. Okay. Um, okay. So when you're building out your risk matrix, you're going to come up with these hazards. Again, I mentioned Annex C. They're IMDRF. I think this is Annex A. Uh, you can find the, the different pre-built hazards that way. So I'm just going to choose one. Let's just say a biocompatibility. Um, and then we're going to come up with a foreseeable event. Um, um, product is not cleaned or um, sterilized properly. And um, I think we're getting into Dwayne's territory here with biocompatibility. <laughs> um, the, the good old days. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah. you know, hazardous situation. How how did this happen? How did someone uh, contaminate this? Um, maybe product was opened prior to uh, entering OR, put in nurse's pocket. I know that's uh, terrifying to to hear, but uh, that happens. And then you think, okay, what are the potential harms that could happen from this? Um, Again, this, I, I can't remember if this is uh, built off, well, we have IMDRF, we have some different smart searches that you could find, but uh, I'm just gonna throw something out there like, um, go ahead. Etienne, while you're on that, that's the next question, was does the, does the IMDFR code search give potential harms in current occurrence rates? Not, uh, not occurrence rates, but uh, yes, the, uh, you can get, um, potential harms from uh, the IMDRF. I can't remember which annex that is off the top of my head. Um, um, let's see here. Yeah. I'm just going to go with infection 
for now. Uh, let's see. I'm just going to leave it at that. But yeah, the IMDRF codes, this is tied to all of that. So, and that is kind of a big deal now in the industry. I don't know if you were at MedCon. Um, a lot of people are now talking about tying your IMDRF codes into your risk matrix. So it's a very practical thing to do. All right. So if I scroll over here, now P1, that's the likelihood of this, uh, this foreseeable event happening. So I'm going to think, okay, maybe one in 365. Um, one day out of the year, someone's not going to clean or sterilize that. Um, and I'm going to say 0.5% or 5% of the time that this hazardous situation could occur. Now, my P0 is a calculation of this foreseeable event and this hazardous situation occurring. So it's going to put it at an occasional based on our the matrix that we built out. And then I'm going to assign a severity to it. I sort of think that uh, that's a serious situation. So I'm going to put it there. And based on the severity and risk, it tells me it's a medium risk. Um, and then I'm going to calculate the residual risk. So what controls do I have in place? I could tie this to my design controls. If I want to tie this to my design inputs, I could do that. I haven't tied this entire risk management um, project to a design controls uh, within the system yet, but I could do that. And so then I could li link to those risk controls. So however you do this, this is essentially the process. You go through and you come up with the severity, you look at the residual or the, the, the risk, and then you calculate again, P1 of the residual risk, um, and then it comes up with a, a final severity. So this is kind of the practical standpoint. And I wish I had more time to spend on that. Are we out of time? What are we looking at, Dwayne? We are technically up on time, but uh, as we go over, I mean, people will just drop off and other people will stay on. Uh, sure. You actually answered most of the questions um, in here. So, um, okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm happy to talk more. You saw a couple of links. Feel free to look at those slides, look at those, uh, the, the resources that we uh, handed out. If I didn't answer any questions or if something was confusing, feel free to reach out. Happy to help in whatever way I can. Yeah, awesome. Um, so, so uh, Etienne, you're pretty active on LinkedIn, right? So people could yeah. find you on there. Um, you can always the, the contact information for anyone who's who's on. We had a few drop right at the top of the hour, Etienne, but there's still a good majority on. So um, you could see Etienne's contact information there um, on the screen now. You could also just reach out to Galen Data. They can get you into contact with him too. So. Um, anyways, uh, thanks everyone for uh, joining. Etienne, thanks so much for your time. Great presentation. Um, and next time we know, we just need to schedule it for an hour and a half or something because <laughs> right. there, there was a, a ton of questions that came in and, and it's always good to see questions that are kind of tied together, which is nice. Um, so no, really appreciate the time. And uh, personally, I learned a ton. All right. Thanks so much. Great to be here. Thanks, everyone.